Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering AWS reInvent 2019. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services and Intel, along with its ecosystem partners. Okay, welcome back everyone, it's theCUBE's live coverage. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE. We're here at reInvent day two as it winds down. Wall-to-wall -wall interviews, two sets here. And we want to thank Intel, who's big sponsor of this set. We, without Intel, we wouldn't have this great content. They support our mission at theCUBE. We really appreciate it. We're here extracting the signal from the noise on our seventh reInvent of the eight years that they've been here. We've been documenting history, and we got a great panel lined up here. We got Sebastian Dehaller, who's the CEO of SailDrone, Henry Stahl Stuhl, EVP of Science and Technology at Bowery Farming, great use case around the food supply, and Janet Pazera, Space Weather Scientist at NASA, the Helo Physics Division. We got a great lineup here, a great panel. Welcome to theCUBE, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Happy we'll start with you, Janet. You're doing some super <laughs> cool space exploration. You're looking at super storms in space. What's your story? Yeah, I work at NASA, and NASA has in its mandate to understand uh, how to protect life on Earth and in space from events like space weather and other things. And I'm working with Amazon right now to understand how storms in space get amplified into super storms in space, which now people uh, understand can have major impacts on infrastructures at Earth like power grids. So there is impact. There's and an you guys are measuring that. Not like yes. a supernova critical thing like that, yeah, yeah, but yeah. more of like practical space yeah, stuff. Yeah, actually the um, idea that um, the perception of the world of the, of the risks of space weather changed dramatically in 1989 when a superstorm actually caused the collapse of a power grid in Canada. And uh, the currents flowing in the ground uh, from the storm entered the power grid and it collapsed in 90 seconds. You couldn't even intervene. Wow, some serious issues. We want to get into the machine learning and how you guys are applying, but let's get through here. Henry, you're doing some pretty cool stuff that's really important mission. Food supply and global food supply, something that you're doing a lot. Take a minute to explain yeah, your exactly. mission. Exactly, yeah, so at Bowery, we're growing food for a better future by revolutionizing agriculture. And to do that, we're building these, uh, a network of large warehouse scale indoor farms where we go uh, all sorts of produce indoors 365 days a year using zero pesticides, uh, using hydroponic systems and uh, LED technology. Uh, so it's really exciting and uh, at the core of it is uh, some technology we call the Bowery Operating System, uh, which is how we leverage uh, software, hardware, and AI to, to operate and learn from our farms. I'm looking forward to digging into that. Sebastian, sail drone, you're doing some stuff, you're sailing around the world. You got a nice tan, is that you? No, tell your story. Sadly, no, <laughs> we, we, we use wind-powered robots uh, to study the 70% of the planet that's uh, currently really uh, data scarce, and that's the oceans. Uh, and so we measure things like biomass, which is how many fish there are in the ocean. We measure the input of energy, which impacts weather and climate. We map the seabed, uh, and we do all kinds of different tasks, which are very, very expensive to do if you use ships. And super important now that climate change is on everyone's agenda, understanding potentially blind spots, super important, right? That's what I'm trying to, under, you know, there's some question of if, it's a question of what, when, and what, and how much. And so, you know, the ice is melting, the, the Gulf Stream is changing, and Nino is, is wreaking havoc, but we just do not understand this because we just don't have the data in situ. We use satellites, where we, they have very low resolution, they cannot see through the water. We use ships, NOAA has 16 ships here in the US, so we have to do better, we have to transform this into a big data problem. So that's what we're doing. We have a thousand sail drones on our plan, we have a hundred in the water right now, and so we're trying to instrument all oceans all the time. You know, and data scales, your friend, because you want more data. Yes. Talk about what you're working on. What kind of AI and machine learning are you doing? You're just gathering data and you're pumping it up to the cloud via satellites, or what's going on there? Yeah, so one of, one of, one of, one of, the, uh, one of the use cases is trying to understand, you know, who's out there, what are they doing, and are they doing anything illegal? So to do this, uh, you need to use cameras and look at the horizon and detect you know, whether you have vessels, and if those vessels are not transmitting the position, it, it means that they're trying to stay hidden on the ocean. And so we use uh, machine learning and AI uh, that we train on, on AWS to try to understand what, where those things are. And it's, it's hard enough on land, I'd see it's very hard, because every pixel is moving. You have waves, the horizon is moving, the sky is moving, the ship is moving, and so trying to solve this problem is a completely new thing. That's called maritime domain awareness, uh, and it's something that has never been done before. And what's the current status of the project? 
So we, we, we've been live for about four years now. Um, we have 100 sail drones. We're building one a day towards the goal of having 1,000, which we covered all the planet in a six by six degree squares. Uh, and we are operationally uh, active uh, in the Arctic, in the tropical Pacific, in the Atlantic. We just circumnavigated Antarctica. Yeah. So it's a thing yeah. that's real. It's out there, but it's yeah. very far from, from, from land. So the spirit of the cloud and the agility, the static buoy yes. goes away. You want to put these sail drones out there to gather and move around and capture that's right, the buoy is you know, a massive steel thing which has a four mile long cable and it's, 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 it's tethered it's to the- It's a silo. In a, in a <laughs> fixed station, it's one point and the ocean goes by you. Having a robot means that you can go where you know, something interesting is happening, where you have a hurricane, where you might have an atmospheric river, where you might have a natural catastrophe or man-made catastrophe. So this intelligence in the platform is really important and the navigation of that platform requires intelligence and on the data side, getting a thousand times more data allows you to understand things better, just like my colleagues here are doing. And is it a non-profit, is it a for-profit venture? It's a for-profit company, so we sell raw data at a, at a, a, you know, a fraction of the cost of, of existing solution uh, to try to create this kind of transformative uh, 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 impact on understanding what's happening. That's super exciting for all the maritime folks out there. Of course, I love the ocean myself. Henry, you, you're tackling a real big mission. How are you uh, using technology? I can almost imagine the instrumentation must be off the charts. What's your um, opp opportunity look like from a tech perspective? Yeah, so the, the level of control we have in our farms is really unparalleled. We can um, tune just about every uh, parameter that goes into growing our plants, from temperature to humidity, CO2, uh, light intensity, uh, day-night cycles, the list keeps going on. And so, to do more with fewer resources, to grow more in our farms, um, well, we're doing something called science at scale, where we can pull different levers and, and make changes to recipes in real time, and uh, we're using AI to understand the impact that those changes have, and to guide us going from millions of different permutations, trillions of permutations really, to uh, the, the perfect outcome, per and converging. You, yeah. And you iterate, look at the product outcome, you circle that data back, it's all on Amazon? Uh, we do operate on Amazon, yeah. Um, and we're using um, you know, deep learning technology to analyze uh, pictures that come from cameras all over our farms. So we actually have eyes on every single uh, crop that grows in our facilities, and so we process those, learn from the, that data, and, and funnel that back into yeah. the, uh, the yeah, system. Yeah, like maybe put more light on this, or do that, and kind of make adjust the conditions, is that that thinking? That's exactly it, and we grow lots of different types of plants. We grow uh, butterhead lettuce, romaine, kale, spinach, arugula, uh, basil, cilantro, so there's a lot of different things we grow, and each of them require different, uh, different little tweaks here and yeah. there to, to produce the, the best tasting and most nutritious product. That's cool. Yeah. Janet, space is obviously you know, on one end of the spectrum. We're going to live on Mars someday, so <laughs> you might be a weather forecaster for you know, what route to take to Mars, but True. right now, the practical matter is this real correlation between these storms. What kind of data problem are you looking at? What is oh. the machine learning? What are some <laughs> of the cool things you're working on? Right, we have a big data problem because storms of that magnitude are very rare. So it's hard for us to find enough data to train AI. We can't actually train AI. We have to use un, you know, un, un, uh, learning that doesn't require us to train it. Um, but we've decided to take the approach that these superstorms are like anomalies on the normal weather pattern. So we're trying to use um, the kind of uh, AI that you use to detect um, anomalies like uh, people who are trying to break into, you know, to do bank fraud or you know, do a web server attacks. We use that same kind of software to try to um, identify anomalies uh, that are the space weather and look at the patterns between uh, sort of a normal, more of a normal storm and a, space we a huge space weather event uh, to see how they, the, the patterns compare and how you are um, amplifying the regular storm into this big superstorm activity. So it sounds like you have to be prepared for identifying the anomaly. So you're looking at anomalies to figure out where the anomaly might be ready <laughs> to be ready to get the anomaly. Yeah, if that's, yeah. That you, you, out wrong. you look at the background and then what sticks out of the background that doesn't look like the background is, is identified as the anomaly and that's the storms that are happening which are quite rare. Well all three of you guys are doing some real cutting edge cool projects. I guess my question would be for the folks that are putting their toe in the water for machine learning, they tend to be new use cases like what you guys are doing. Whether it's just a company trying to re, re, 
factor themselves or re become reborn in the cloud, ran legacy stuff. When you're here at Amazon reInvent, this is the big question for these folks that are here. You guys are on the front end of some really cool projects. What's your advice to people who are trying to get in that mindset? Yeah, so I think, I think you know, the, way, the way to think about this is if you're good at something and if you think you have the solution for something, how can you make that a million times more efficient? And so the, the problem is there's just not enough capacity in the world usually to treat data sets that are a million times larger. And this is where machine learning should be thought of as an, as an extension of what a human is really good at using a pair of eyes, ears, you know, or whatever other sense. And so in our case, for example, counting fish, acousticians, trained acousticians look at sonar data and understand schools of fish and can recognize them. And by using this knowledge base, we can train machines to do this on a much grander scale. And when you do it on a much grander scale, you derive a whole entire, so entire Your new point insights. is that humans are critical Absolutely. in the process. So scaling the human capabilities and maybe filling in either that's, scale issues or That's what AI spots. machine learning is. It's the greatest enabler of our time. It enables us to do things which were impossible to do before because we just didn't have enough people uh, to do them at scale. And a key is being able to ask questions, right? And so if you have the questions to ask, you can apply this technology in a way that's never really been before possible. Jenna, your take. Yeah, I, I am actually someone who didn't know anything about AI or ML when I started. I'm a, I'm a research scientist that does space weather. So coming into this, I'm uh, working with the ML uh, Solutions Lab here and putting AI experts with, with experts in space weather, we're getting, we're doing things that are going to give us new advances. I mean, I, we're already seeing things we didn't know before. Um, so I think that if you partner uh, with people who really have strong AI knowledge, you can use your um, knowledge of science to really get to the really important issues. Okay, I have to ask the final lightning round question. What is the coolest thing that you've done with your project that you've either observed, implemented, that is super cool? Super cool. What's the coolest thing? <laughs> well, in, in terms of us, we're using anomaly detection to identify storms, and in the first round through, it actually identified every single super storm, which was not the major superstorms, but it did, but it also started identifying other um, anomalous events. And when you went and looked at them, they were anomalous events. So we're seeing things, uh, it's picking out the weird things that are happening in space weather. It's kind of exciting and interesting. I worked for a day with you. <laughs> I would love to just look at these anomalies. Yeah, Henry, yeah. what's the coolest thing that you've, you've, you've seen or done with your project? I think the, the fact that we've built our own custom hardware, our own camera systems, uh, and that we feed those um, through algorithms that tell us something about what's happening uh, you know, minute by minute with plants as they grow. To see uh, pictures of plants minute by minute, they dance. And it's truly, it's, it's remarkable. Wow, fascinating. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Sebastian. Uh, we've counted every single fish on the west coast of the United States every <laughs> single year, from Canada to Mexico. I thought that was wow. pretty cool. I didn't think it was That's possible. very cool. But, uh, what's the number? <laughs> uh, it's the, huge. For, for, yeah, if I, if I could tell you, I would, but uh, I'm not allowed to tell you. <laughs> Next get year. The salmon, <laughs> you know where the salmon are, when they're running, all that good stuff, awesome. Mm. Well, congratulations, you guys are doing some amazing work. This is uh, pioneering, a great example of just what's coming. And I love this angle of making larger human impact using technology, where you guys are shaping technology for good things. Really, really exciting. Thanks for coming Thank on. You John. Thanks Thanks for Thank you, John. Sharing your story. Appreciate it. I'm John Furrier. We're here live in Vegas for reInvent 2019. Stay with us for more coverage. Day three coming tomorrow. We're back with more after this, after this break. I want to thank Intel for making it all happen, presented by Intel. Without their sponsorship, we wouldn't be able to bring this great content. Thanks for watching. <laughs>